now one past. So I'll start slowly, but surely. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I don't know if it's a morning, if it's an evening or an afternoon for you, but um, I hope it's a good one. Um, my name is Sham Jaff, and I welcome you all to the fourth episode, no, to the fifth episode of our online discussion series, um, Reframing Reproduction. Uh, today, we are reframing reproduction technologies. Um, there are a lot of different reproduction technologies um, and reproductive technologies were primarily intended actually for heterosexual couples who were unable to have a child. Uh, but for some years now, they've also been used to enable childbearing at an older age or within queer relationships and other alternative family forms. And the focus of today's panel is on two reproductive technologies in particular, uh, which is egg transfer and surrogacy, uh, two somewhat controversial pro procedures that are regulated uh, very differently from region to region. And um, today, rather than asking very, um, discussing the individual desires uh, and family planning, uh, we want to ask some structural and collective questions of justice on the usage and consequences of egg transfer and surrogacy on a global level. Um, basically questions such as whose reproduction is desired by the state, um, whose rights and access to assisted reproductive technology are implemented, whose are not, whose are prevented by exclusion mechanisms. Um, and is there a right to have your own, to have a genetic child? And if yes, how do we regulate um, or how do we guarantee this right without infringing upon the rights of other people? Um, but before I move on to introducing um, our brilliant panelists for today, there are a few things I'd like to point out before um, we begin, a few housekeeping rules. Um, first of all, perhaps, perhaps you caught it in the beginning, but this conversation is um, live streamed and is currently being recorded. Um, if you are in the chat and if you are active on social media, uh, you can use um, our specific hashtags for this event to collect your feedback, to share your views and thoughts on today's event. You feel free to post um, and engage in a discussion with one another, either online on social media or in the chat. Um, I would love for you to also in the chat, introduce yourselves. Please use it as a networking space, as a place for you all to share ideas since we all are here because we all are interested in the topic of reproductive technologies. So the chat, feel free to use it as the bar space or as the little bit of a virtual sitting living room where you can meet some other like-minded people. Um, also, you are most welcome, not only just to network within the chat, but also to ask questions throughout the panel. Um, in the very last minutes of our conversation, um, there will be a designated 30 minute Q&A slot for you all to ask all of your questions, but even throughout the entire panel, feel free to ask questions. If it fits in and I see it, I will put it in and ask, uh, ask the question right away. Um, if it fits in at the end of the session, please just have a little bit of patience with me and I will include your question at the very end. Um, also, Heinrich Böll Stiftung has generously made uh, translation available to four languages, uh, German, uh, French, and Spanish, I'm in English as I'm speaking now. Um, and you can access the translation at the little globe at the bottom of uh, your screen. Um, if you cannot find it, you can ask the chat for guidance, but um, already thank you in advance to the translation team um, uh, you have always been doing such a good job so far, and I'm sure you're going to do great today as well. And also many thanks to the organizing team. Um, without the organizing team, this online discussion series, this amazing online discussion series would have not taken place. Um, so thank you very much to Deria, Jana, Naida, and Adna. Um, and I would say, let's begin. Um, I want to say a very welcome 
a very warm welcome to our panelists today. Um, I would like to start with introducing you, Sarojni. Sarojni is a public health researcher and social scientist and the co-founder of SAMA, Resource Group for Women and Health, an organization that is based in Delhi. She's also joining us today from Delhi. Um, the organization bridges the public health and women's movement. Sarojni is also the coordinator of the Gender Justice Circle of People's Health Movement Global. She works at the intersection of public health, human rights, women's health, and marginalization. She's led several studies, fact findings, and advocacy over the past two decades on health systems, medical and reproductive technologies, um, including assisted reproduction technology and surrogacy, and is currently looking at the pandemic from a gender equity and intersectionality lens. Sarojni also serves on the Central Ethics Committee on Biomedical Research of the Indian Council for Medical Research and has also been appointed as a member of the Expert Committee to assess the impact of COVID-19 um, to the Indian government. I'm so um, grateful that you're here today, Sarojni. Welcome. Thank you so much. Next up is uh, Jovan Jolovic. I hope I said your name correctly. Uh, Jovan has been actively involved in the protection and promotion of human rights of LGBTQ persons and gender equality since 2013, and is one of the leading activists in this field in the Western Balkans region. Um, he is one of the founders of the LGBTQ association Queer Montenegro, where he's, where he's normally based, but today he's joining us from where I am, which is in Berlin. Um, Jovan is a member of the initial organizing committee of the National Pride March of LGBTQ Persons Montenegro Pride, together with a group of activists from the countries of the former Yugoslavia. In 2014, he was one of the founders of the regional organization Trans Network Balkan, which deals with the protection of the human rights of trans, gender, and intersex persons in the Western Balkans. And since 2017, he has been the executive director of the association Spectra, the only trans organization in Montenegro, and is also the co-chair of the board of the Umbrella European organization, organization Transgender Europe. And next up, and our last panelist, but not least, um, Amrita Pande. Amrita is joining us today from Cape Town, from South Africa. Um, Amrita is a professor in the sociology department of University of Cape Town. Um, her research focuses on the intersection of globalization and the intimate. She is the author of several uh, writings. Among those are Wombs in Labor, Transnational Commercial Surrogacy in India, and Birth Controlled, Selective Reproduction, Selective Reproduction and Neo-Eugenics in India and South Africa. Over the past 20 years, Ambita has conducted multi-sided research on fertility clinics, on traveling egg provision, on cross-border surrogacy in India, Cambodia, Ghana, and South Africa. So Ambita is also an educator performer touring the world with a performance lecture series made in India, notes from a baby, based on her ethnographic work on surrogacy. And um, Amrita is currently leading a national research foundation project exploring the global fertility flows of eggs, sperms, embryos, and wombs connecting the world in unexpected ways. We will be talking a little bit about that too. Uh, so happy you are all here. Um, thanks so much for joining the conversation. Um, I, I would just start with you, Sarojini. So since we are today, we're talking about egg transfer and surrogacy. Um, but one of the most common and globally widespread forms of um, reproduction technology is basically sperm donation. It's been around. I've, I've known about this one reproduction technology for um, almost, uh, that, that was the first technology that I've heard of. But egg donation and surrogacy are more controversial and they're regulated very differently depending on the country. Um, they're becoming a popular option for many people to build a family. Why do you think that is? Okay, uh, 
thank you. First of all, thank you very much uh, for having me on this panel and uh, looking forward to learning from my other co-panelists and also from the participants here. Um, I just wanted to, you know, uh, clarify here, like uh, uh, particularly from the Indian context, uh, is that uh, if you are talking about surrogacy and you know, we call a donation, uh, uh, a transfer will come under the assisted reproductive technologies. But in surrogacy itself, the, though it is an arrangement, the technique has been used is IVF, that in vitro fertilization, the embryo transfer. So it, they both are interlinked in uh, when it comes to the technology, like uh, uh, in ARTs, in the assisted reproductive technology, uh, earlier, we had intrauterine insemination, but now we only have the uh, in vitro fertilization with the various forms. So uh, I just wanted to make it very clear. If you talk about surrogacy, it includes in vitro fertilization and also embryo transfer, definitely, you know, which is also part of the technologies. Uh, uh, yeah, I think um, uh, it, it's very complex, the question, in fact, uh, and uh, uh, like why uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, as I, I just wanted to take a talk about the equity, you know, when we talk about the technology in that context, I would like to look at uh, ARTs or egg donation or commercial surrogacy here. Uh, because when we talk about technologies, you know, that is what we are arguing right now, uh, moving beyond infertility. You know, it's not just a question of infertility, which we used to talk in the past, uh, saying that, you know, why we are not addressing the fundamental issue of infertility, why we are only looking at the, you know, uh, the technological solutions to address a social problem. But now uh, we could see in the last five, six years, the discourse has been changed. It is also talking about the, you know, other equity issues very much because most of the technologies are available only in the private sector in India. So even if you are talking about, you know, whether it is uh, egg donation or uh, surrogacy, it is only available for the rich people. Uh, you know, if I'm talking uh, in the context of uh, the equity. Uh, so, you know, it's very interesting because I'm looking at COVID and vaccines too. So when we talk about technology, uh, technology in whose interest comes a big question for me, you know, where you are, you are still paying for the vaccines. Uh, for example, you know, the technology which is supposed to be equitable and accessible and affordable to everyone. It, the same question applies even to the reproductive technologies as well. So here you have to pay your mortgage or because you want to have a biological child, uh, irrespective of your class, caste, race, you're going for the technology but it is not equitable, it is not accessible. So that is something which I wanted to make it very clear here. The second point, uh, maybe I'm digressing a little bit from the question, uh, but even in the context of the equity, again, I want to bring it, uh, bring the focus on to the, the current legislations which we have in India, you know, both uh, on the assisted reproductive technology, which talks about in vitro fertilization, and other technologies there, and also the Surrogacy Regulation Act, which were passed in 2021 in December, both are discriminatory and they're not equitable. If you look at the definitions, I'm sure we will be talking about yes. it uh, too. Yes, I have a question exactly so on that. That is something which is, uh, there are two things. Like, you know, again, the, the one is equity in the context of who can access, one is the class, other is also about your gender and sexuality and sexual expression. And that is something which we also need to bring into our own reproductive justice argument. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the third is about the, uh, what we could see here is like, who's eligible, you know, uh, either to be a surrogate or who can access the, you know, a, a transfer or uh, IVF technology. Again, that is a third part which we have to look into. So there is a discriminatory practice within the legislation itself. We will be talking about that. So the, the legislations are in that way extremely discriminatory, uh, which uh, are uh, based on the heteronormative and patriarchal 
Uh, this is yeah. Sarajni, I think you're, you're taking away all of my points here. Okay, <laughs> I have so okay. many questions exactly yeah. on this. Okay, okay, I will. But perhaps, uh, yeah. perhaps I know you're the expert here among here our, our, our panelists. I I know that a lot of people probably also, um, you know, maybe we need to start at the beginning, at the basics a little bit, and to to come to that to those points that you raised so important um, points, yeah. and I will be going back to those. Um, perhaps we start. Um, from from the very basic question of because I, I I approached this when I when I was preparing for this panel and when I was preparing the questions for you all I approached this as someone who didn't really think of having babies so it wasn't it wasn't anything that I was personally thinking of myself so when I was looking into all these new options for people to build a family I was of course I was extremely excited about all these new possibilities but also extremely frightened by all the implications it has uh, for other people. So perhaps we could break that a little bit and enter that um, and enter this discussion um, and try to open this up a little bit. Um, Amrita, could you perhaps talk a little bit about the different types of surrogacy? Because I, I know we have like, you know, traditional and gestational. Um, can you describe the difference between the two and do the motives change depending on the type of surrogacy? And if yes, how do they change? Oh, uh, sure, Sham. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for having me here. And, um, and thanks, Orojini, for opening up the field in such a beautiful way. So, so coming back to the basics, so surrogacy is, of course, when a woman agrees to become pregnant for the purpose of gestating, uh, and giving birth to a child for others to raise. So the, the question you asked about traditional and gestational. So she may be the child's genetic mother, in which case it is traditional surrogacy, or she may be implanted with someone else's fertilized eggs, gestational surrogacy. All the cases that I have worked with in, whether that be India, Cambodia, or Ghana, fall under the category of gestational surrogacy, where the surrogate has no genetic connections with the baby. And in fact, as Sarojini was alluding to, in gestational surrogacy is slowly becoming the norm, although this is a way more complicated process than traditional surrogacy. And when surrogacy started becoming a popular so-called fix offered by clinics and medical professionals, what was offered in the United States was traditional surrogacy. The surrogate is no, in, in, in traditional surrogacy, where the surrogate is also the genetic uh, mother. So... As you can, as soon as I start saying this, you start realizing why gestational surrogacy has become so popular. Um, because within traditional surrogacy, surrogacy can become a legal and ethical nightmare because the surrogate, in some sense, has a large claim on the baby. And so, when IVF came into being, it solved the problem in a couple of ways. Now, the genetic mother, the one who provided the eggs, could be separated from the gestational mother, the mother who gestates. And legally, in some sense, it also was a bit of a relief because not relief for activists, but relief for intended parents, that the connection between the surrogate and the baby in some sense could be constructed as far less powerful than under traditional surrogacy arrangements. And I think commercially, as Deborah Spar wrote in her book in the 1990s, commercially it increased the supply of both uh, surrogates and egg donors because women were more willing to donate eggs if they did not also have to undergo the pregnancy. And they were also more interested in serving as surrogates if the child that they were carrying was not genetically theirs. So in some sense, the separation of uh, the eggs and the womb not only allowed the market to flourish, but it also changed the market. And in and if I can just add another thing there, that in traditional surrogacy, because the surrogate also provides the genetic matter, so to say, the intended parents, the parents who want the child, they are more likely to emphasize the so-called right genetic material, genetic makeup. They want to know what the surrogate looks like, whether she went to college or not. So the, and the things that very often uh, now people look for in egg providers. But what I've seen in many parts of the global south that in gestational surrogacy, they're looking for very different things in the surrogate. And of course, we can talk way more about that. 
And what gestational surrogacy then does is that it allows the surrogacy market to go, go global. So a South Korean woman sitting in Los Angeles can fly down to your little clinic in Western India and hire an Indian woman to have a baby for her or for them. Mm -hmm. We will be definitely talking about, you know, de decoupling uh, women from pregnancy a little bit later on, because I think it's a very, it's a very interesting uh, point of the uh, aspect of the discussion. Um, Jovan, do transgender, genderqueer and non-binary individuals, do they have specific factors to consider in planning a good family or planning for a family even? And is surrogacy and egg transfer a, a good alternative? Um, I'm, I'm very glad that we started this discussion from the point of equity and accessibility, uh, because when you ask me this, uh, I can say that for majority of trans, uh, non-binary, genderqueer, gender fluid people, majority of us uh, options for, of reproductive technology are so far from any discussion that includes trans people. And I think that this is something that uh, uh, is not only a question of inclusion of trans people in the reproductive justice uh, discussions, but it's also a question on uh, for who is reproductive justice. So, because reproductive justice cannot be uh, divided from the topic of body integrity, uh, the right to family, the right to dignity and your own life. Uh, trans people are still uh, a part of different practices which are like soft eugenic practices. So across the world, trans people are being sterilized. In Europe, there are still nine countries which require sterilization in order to change uh, legal documents, uh, which is something that you basically have no choice if you want to navigate the world with the documents that are in alliance with your gender identity and your gender expression. And I will uh, give a, a bit of a personal experience because I think that this is, uh, because I think that these are very uh, uh, valuable. So for example, when uh, I, I used to be a biologist before I was very, very involved in activism. So I was very interested in different, uh, in uh, investigating different reproductive technologies uh, because I wanted to know what are my options. So I'm based in Montenegro. That's the periphery of Europe. Montenegro is a very poor country uh, and uh, doesn't have a lot of access uh, to, to, to resources. So 10 years ago, uh, when I started investigating that, there were a lot of uh, discussions about different, very advanced technologies. So I'm not speaking here only about surrogacy and egg donation. I'm speaking here about uh, uh, making uh, eggs from uh, matical cells from skin uh, uh, or uh, transplantation of uterus. Uh, these are all the reproductive technologies that developed in the past few years. So back in the days uh, when I spoke with my endocrinologist and I asked him like, what are my options? If I'm going to remove uh, my ovaries now and I needed to because my state required sterilization, uh, what is my option uh, if some at some point I want uh, to have uh, uh, if I want to have children, and he said, for example, well, you can uh, um, still uh, preserve one ovary inside your body. Uh, that was an option, and I think that that was very progressive from my endocrinologist because I think that majority of them would uh, tell me like. What do you mean? Like, you accept the sterilization? Like, why do you now speak about all these reproductive technologies? So in my region, there was, at that point, there was only one clinic where I could uh, preserve my egg cells. And it was very expensive. At that moment, I literally uh, had no money at all. And this is the case for majority of trans people because we are excluded from the market as workers 
most of the time. Uh, and majority of trans people cannot afford any kind of reproductive technology. And when I'm speaking about all of these progressive technologies like uterus transplant or uh, uh, different uh, making of different uh, of the egg cells from the other uh, cells which have the potential uh, to, to become reproductive uh, cells, this is something that is literally sci-fi for majority of people and uh, in general. And I think it's, uh, it's so far from all marginalized communities, including, including uh, the trans community. So I think that when we speak about ethical concerns regarding reproductive uh, technologies. We cannot speak about these ethical concerns without being ethically concerned about the position of different communities in relation to access to economic resources, in relation to ac access to the right for your to your own body to make your own choices and uh, and uh, decide for yourself. Uh, what are you going to do uh, 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 with your life? Because I think that majority of these discussions are um, led in the uh, in the uh, area of uh, the right of woman to her own body, and I think that we should discuss this. But I think that this discussion is very fallible without taking into consideration all of our uh, characteristics that put us in specific position, like our class, our, our geographical uh, position, our race, our ethnical identity, our access to different resources, including economic, uh, economic ones. Thank you so much for that. If we stay on the topic of choice, Sarojni, who usually chooses to become a surrogate? Could you tell me a little bit about um, yeah, who, who, who is the surrogate? Um, I know that specifically if we take a look at India, for example, I know that thousands of women in India chose to become surrogates since 2002 when they first legalized it. Um, what's, the, what's the average demographic? What could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, well, uh, our work is, uh, I just wanted to uh, make it very clear that our work with the company Surrogates is basically in the northern part, um, and uh, you know from our own ethnography, I can uh, very clearly say that most of them coming from the very poorer backgrounds, and uh, some of them were domestic workers, and some of them were working as a rat pickers, and uh, some of them are like just housewives, and uh, husbands are enrolled in uh, uh, in a wage work. Uh, so majority are uh, below poverty line. Uh, so uh, it's a poor women who are opting for surrogacy. That is very, very clear. Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, uh, you know, there are maybe, there may be, you know, uh, a couple of uh, uh, the film Hollywood personalities who went to surrogacy. That's a very different, uh, 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 you know, scenario altogether. So I don't want to compare, but generally the surrogates are coming from the uh, low income uh, groups. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is uh, very clear from our work. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would like to opt for surrogacy because mm -hmm. uh, some of our, we made a film. In fact, I can share the link actually. It's called, Can We See the Baby Pump, Please? Mm -hmm. uh, it's available on YouTube. Uh, which talks about the, you know, the lives of surrogate mothers in surrogacy homes. And what Amrita just now narrated about the way uh, you can sit in a Mumbai clinic in a surrogacy hostel and you are a surrogate for a couple who are in Florida mm -hmm. and how they, you know, interact to uh, Skype. Uh, that's why can we see the baby bump and then looking at the baby bump of the surrogate here in a small clinic in Mumbai and trying to monitor from Florida, the couples are asking, show us your baby bump, you know, we want to see the growth of the baby. So, uh, the, you know, the, the women, they may not know the language at all because uh, most of the couples earlier, you know, now the situation we do not have any international surrogacy with the foreign nationals. So uh, that has been banned mm -hmm. through the law. 
but even otherwise and you know, it's not necessarily each surrogate even within the country they are familiar we have so many languages in the country uh, uh, it's very difficult in terms of communications and the way they live in and it also depends from uh, you know our, our experiences like from location to location in the cities it's very different from the small towns it is very different mm -hmm. when you are at home as a surrogate you know in your own uh, you know setting which is not such well equipped you may not have a, a major help at home and you already have a live child that is a criteria to become a surrogate so in that context uh, many prefer to go to the surrogacy homes and then i'm sure amrita has a lot of experience with the anand experience there like why women prefer to be in the surrogacy home when women are in the surrogacy homes they didn't want to be there all the time because uh, it's completely disconnected with the family mm -hmm. and you're always under surveillance and there are certain things you need to maintain you need to eat certain kind of food and you need to sleep at particular time and also in the film in fact one woman talks about like uh, you have to listen to the you know devotional songs so that you can imbibe the values of the good values to the fetus and all that happens so it is very interesting like in the controls in a subtle way at the same time you know uh, you want to become a surrogate because you will get a money at a go Mm -hmm. uh because if you have somebody posted a question i can see that you know yeah if you are a daily wage earner uh, you may get you know uh, maybe you know 10 dollars or uh, 12 dollars but if you become a surrogate there may be a big amount which you will get it into installments so or uh, three installments whatever it is but you are getting a big money which can be used for uh, you know that is what they say that it's for the children's education or to construct a home of uh, some health issue you know these are the things which are uh, you know push people to opt for surrogacy mm -hmm. yeah thank you so much i was going to ask you the question but you've uh, answered it now yourself um amrita if we stay here on the topic of money um well your book is the first detailed ethnography of india surrogacy industry wombs of, uh, in wombs and labor um, you visited clinics and hostels and spoke with surrogates and their families and clients, and you spoke to so many, so many aspects of the uh, surrogacy industry. Um, what can you tell us about this uh, business and the experiences of the surrogates within it or the laborers within it? Thanks, Sham. Uh, Sarojini has already started answering these questions. So, but let me take you back a little bit uh, because now we are sitting in 2022 and very often uh, we write of surrogacy um, as a labor market, almost like we always thought of surrogacy as a labor market. But 16 years ago, when I started my PhD on the topic of surrogacy, the focus of surrogacy used to be in Europe and the United States. And of course, that was not surprising since surrogacy uh, is a very recent phenomenon outside of the Euro-American context. But even then, in the early 2000s, people were already making predictions as to what will happen if surrogacy went to the so-called third world, what will happen when uh, we have baby farms where white embryos will be grown in the bodies of third world women. So these, these kind of predictions were being made, but nobody, everybody like um, uh, Johan was talking about, this was more sci-fi at that time than really happening. Um, but when I went to this small clinic in West India and I started studying the surrogacy industry, I started realizing that my understanding of surrogacy, I was doing my PhD in the United States and I was also familiar with radical feminist literature from the US and Europe. And I came to realize that this kind of Eurocentric training was not going to be adequate for what I was witnessing in the surrogacy hostel and the surrogacy industry in India. And as this surrogacy industry started unfolding in other parts of the global south, not just in India, but now I've studied it in Thailand and Mexico and Cambodia, Nepal, Laos, uh, increasingly now apparently it's moving to Kenya, Nigeria. So these kind of understandings of surrogacy as mainly a moral debate was just not going to work for the kind of surrogacy industry that has unfolded in the global south. So that's what I was trying to do in my book, Wombs and Labor, 
it, I was trying to argue that it would be a mistake to think of surrogacy as just a story of reproduction, where there's a poor woman who can give you a baby and there's a richer woman who can get the baby. Because this kind of formulation would leave out of its ambit many, many more important in discussions. So, for instance, surrogate, the word surrogate mother. So, the Indian surrogate mother is not just a substitute mother. No, she's participating in an extremely difficult industry that is morally problematic, yes, but it's also deviant very much like sex work. It's very deviant. It's dirty. It's considered unnatural. And while some of these women might have been forced into it by their family, and we have many examples of that as well, where the mother-in-law has forced the surrogate to become a surrogate, many others are actually negotiating actively with their family to become a surrogate and to participate in this process. And they, these women, these Indian women especially, and actually in many parts of the global south, it's the same story. These surrogates find themselves in a very strange situation because till now there were these poor women in a poor country who had never access to medical facilities, even when they wanted to. And suddenly they're bombarded with medical facilities. And this is pretty important to emphasize in countries like South Africa, in countries like uh, Cambodia, in countries like India, Nepal, all these countries, these are basically antenatal countries where the state has always told these women not to have babies. They've been exposed to very aggressive population control measures, but suddenly they are encouraged to have babies because they're having babies for someone else to keep. So, and, and of course, there's another layer that they're grappling with many different relationships across race, class, nationality. And if we just keep thinking about, is this moral? Is this immoral? We ignore all these complexities. And when I use the labor um, argument in, and, and I said in my book that there are similarities with embodied labor. So I was talking about sex work. There are similarities with embodied labor or dirty labor, there are similarities with God's labor. So a lot of these uh, women, and Sarojini would um, know what I'm talking about, talked of this as punya kya kam. This is, this is divine work. And divine because they're being able to produce something which is really valuable for the first time. It's not just uh, a domestic work. It's not just glass bangers. It's not just a a shirt in a factory, they're producing something really valuable. But at the same time, they are able to produce something that gives them at least the chance to dream that their savings will work towards changing their lives, the lives of their daughters, the lives of their family. So this surrogacy became like a stepping stone for many of them. Did it actually change their lives? Very often not. So I, I revisited these women 10 years after they had become surrogates very often they continue to be domestic workers. But let's not get despondent already. The, the surrogacy was a, a kind of a way to dream that this would be a portal to another kind of life. And just one last thing, Sham, I want to add here about the labor debate, because it's sometimes really misunderstood that when we say that surrogacy is a kind of a labor, it's not to take conversations away from the problems of surrogacy. It's not to say that surrogacy is just like any other occupation of choice. No, it's a very, I should say, deliberate feminist political project that urges us to move away from the sensational and the exotic within this and instead pay systematic attention to the real messiness of this industry and to understand by centering the lived experiences of these women understand the potential inequity as well as paths to justice. Thank you so much, Amrita. Um, perhaps if we stay there a little bit, because India also banned commercial surrogacy. Um, and I, I asked myself, like, is, what did it, what has changed since the ban, Sarojini? Sorry, you're on mute. Just need to unmute. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Can I, uh, can you, the second point, the first one is about the ban. And yes. What has changed since the ban? Did the ban ultimately take away some of the dangers or did it make it worse? What happened after the ban? 
on commercial uh, surrogacy. Okay. Uh, commercial surrogacy has been legally in the sense, you know, now the new reg uh, legislation, it has come in only in 2021 December. Mm. So it's very difficult to say like, you know, what is the impact of the legislation? They are still formulating the rules. Mm. So, uh, but uh, from uh, 2013 itself, you know, there was a, uh, a guideline uh, which has come from the Ministry of uh, External Affairs, Ministry of Commerce, later from the Home Affairs, uh, banning the foreign nationals to uh, engage in commercial surrogacy. So that was there from the 2013 itself, but now legally there was only the bill, you know, mm. which was not a legislation, but now the bill has become uh, an act. So in 2020-21, uh, it has been passed by the parliament. Um, I, 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 I'm not very sure. That was a concern which we all had. What will happen uh, with this kind of, uh, you know, ban? Definitely, you know, as feminists, as human rights activists, we don't believe in ban. Definitely, we wanted to ask for regulation, mm -hmm. regulating the industry and protecting the rights of surrogate mothers and also the protecting the rights of the children who are born through surrogacy. That was one major issue which has come up when the international surrogacy was happening uh, because the citizenship of the child, statelessness, that is a word they have used. Uh, what will happen to the child if the country of the origin, the, uh, the, commis the commissioning couple where it is not allowed the surrogacy, then what will happen to the citizenship of the child? That was one of the major issues, a uh, diplomatic issues, in fact, which came up uh, in our own work. We could see that we have interacted many times with the parliamentary staff too. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, the concern here is about, uh, for us always, the ban will push the surrogacy into you know uh, black markets mm -hmm. uh, which happened actually with the you know organ industry organ sale you know uh, there are parallels with that too you know what there is still kidney racketeering is happening in the country and uh, in fact you know which is very very uh, uh, i was deeply pained you know one of the, the surrogate uh, mother whom i interviewed in the past and uh, she has come to us and then she said, uh, of course, she moved out of her family now. Uh, uh, she said, like, uh, is there, I, I thought she's asking for, a, you know, some job, some domestic work or something like that, some employment. She said, uh, Didi, can you tell me uh, how can I sell my kidney? You know, and she was one of my, you know, that really made me feel like, you know, where exactly that will push people. Uh, I, this may be, you know, I'm not, I don't want to sensationalize, but uh, definitely people will find their own ways to become the commercial surrogates too. And it doesn't mean that altruistic surrogacy is, surrogacy is something not exploitative at all. And here we are, we live in a patriarchal society. That is what our question is. Where is the agency of the women in that? Uh, so, but it is a law now. We, you know, you cannot have commercial surrogacy. But let's see if there are any amendments which will come in. Uh, that's the status of the. So it's very difficult for me to say the impact of it. Of course, you know, there are clinics because it was only in the private industry, the hostels, the clinics. But surrogacy is available for the available for the Indian nationals, uh, but not commercial surrogacy. Uh, Jovan, perhaps we can move towards um, the, um, another aspect of this um, conversation, which would be um, the, the way surrogacy and egg transfer impacts um, how we view parenthood um, and how we view families, right? Um, do you think that we run the risk of the way we are using egg transfer and um, surrogacy, do we think? Do you think we are, we run the risk of imitating kind of the heteronormative genetic family? But the question that I'm asking myself, because I live in Berlin, right? We have so many different family models in the city. Why are there so few families who are not normative 
um, as in who have more than two parents? Um, I would answer to this question that uh, I'm not sure that few families are heteronormative. Uh, I think that is the case uh, if we see it on the surface, but I know a lot of families who are not uh, normative, and I think that this division between heteronormative and non-normative families is quite... Um, I would not divide families like that. Uh, I think that families are quite more complex. I come from a community where we say it takes a village to raise a child. And in my community, it's not only that mother and father raise you, it's that the whole community raises you in a way. For me, that's not heteronormative. And I think that uh, for many queer people, uh, in queer community, I have uh, faced a lot of narrative uh, when actually I face two narratives. One is shaming people for imitating heteronormative families. And the other one is uh, uh, shaming people for being overly queer. And I think also that this division is not the proper uh, division because I think that we all have the right to choose our fit. Uh, like how do we frame our families? Who is the part of our families? I was uh, in a situation where I gathered my chosen family besides my big family where I was born in. Uh, and they're both my families. Um, I was also in a situation where I was in one big European pride and me and uh, my partner were the only ones who were stopped for entering the pride because we looked like straight couple, like a man and a woman, and people ask, ask us for these uh, permissions to come into the pride. And for me, that's superficial because I'm a passing trans man. I have that privilege and uh, nobody who doesn't know me would say that I'm transgender man. And uh, based on that, we would say that I'm imitating a heteronormative family and my life uh, in my context, because I think that the context is very important, uh, is very queer when you choose to live. For me, for example, living as an openly transgender man in Podgorica in Montenegro, that's very queer <laughs> because it's a hyper-masculine culture. It's very patriarchal culture. It's very collective society. We're a small community. We are all connected with each other. So I basically know like majority of people in my country, like their families and they know my family. So in that, in that kind of context and setting, I think that we should be careful uh, not to have a patronizing attitude towards people in the way that they shape their lives. I, for example, uh, if you ask people who don't have a lot of access to economic resources, for example, like, are we in a risk of imitating uh, middle class, bourgeois? <laughs> so we all want some kind of comfort. We all want our life to be... Uh, the best idea of our our life and i would only uh, uh, also add to something that that amrita and sajorini were saying i uh, really like that this discussion led uh, to the discussion about labor because i think uh, in how we frame labor uh, i totally agree not every work and labor is the same and we are not discussing, for example, uh, what is the effect of labor in fabrics where people are making two cents per day, uh, how alienating that is for our bodies and our, and our uh, minds. Uh, I don't believe in non-exploitive labor in capitalism. Uh, and I think that all of these 
characteristics and all of these issues are very important in how we frame the whole uh, the whole uh, uh, discussion regarding uh, uh, reproductive uh, reproductive justice. For example, even if I have a child tomorrow with my partner. Uh, on the first look, maybe we would look like a typical heteronormative uh, family, but th there is nothing her heteronormative about it, nothing heteronormative in my body, in my identity, nothing heteronormative in my access to reproductive uh, justice and nothing heteronormative in my access to economic resources because me being queer trans man that's very connected with my kind of labor in this society my access to reproductive justice or any other uh, 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 justice uh, in, in in my context thank you so much Jovan. um amrita i know because we don't we are we don't have that much time left, but um, and this is a huge topic. Of, this is a huge aspect of the of your work, of course, when you speak from the global South perspective or when you look at global fertility flows. Um, most of the fertility clinics are in the global North, um, and most of the surrogates come from the global South. And um, as I mentioned, you are currently leading a research project. Uh, where you map these flows, these global fertility flows that connects that connect countries in the global south. Tell us a little bit about that project. Thanks, Sham. Uh, it's very hard to tell you a little bit about this project, <laughs> but I'll try. I'll try my best. So, um, what I call uh, global fertility flows in my next book is essentially what we're talking about right now, which is clients traveling across the world to fulfill their dreams of having a genetically related baby or a baby tailor-made to their expectations. And um, this is actually related to these conversations around legalization as well that we've been having um, you know, where Sarojini has been taking us. So as one-stop surrogacy becomes almost impossible in the global south because of the various bans that different countries have put. The whole process has been split into different stages with different countries finding a niche in the baby making process. So essentially what happens is that uh, now clients have to can't just go to India and say, okay, I'm just going to arrive and pick up my baby, right? They are various stages of the baby making process and they have to identify which country which will legally allow what aspect of the baby making process. So what essentially happens is, is that clients travel across the world to fulfill their dreams, reproductive gametes, by that I mean sperms, eggs and reproductive laborers, sperm providers, egg providers, gestational surrogate mothers also have to move around. So to understand this transnationality of this process in a sense. So now that I can't just go and immerse myself in one clinic in India and study and work with the surrogates right from the beginning and meet the intended parents, see the embryo transfer, see the birth all in one place. That's not possible anymore because now the process has been broken down into various segments and each segment is carried out in different parts of the world. So what I'm doing in my next book is I'm conducting research in three, I've conducted research in three related sites the preparation of white egg providers in global egg agencies in South Africa before they start traveling to various global fertility clinics across the world. I'm saying it slowly because this is very sci-fi like. Then the egg retrieval and the making of an embryo in a global fertility clinic in India. Eggs retrieved, egg providers being created, um, being prepared in South Africa, that's one aspect. The egg retrieval and the embryo making happening in a clinic in India, that's the second aspect. Then because now transnational clients can't access surrogates in India, what do we do with that embryo that has been created in India? 
the embryo of say a Californian couple. Now that embryo needs to be exported to a country where gestational surrogacy is allowed for foreigners. So till a couple of years ago, till three years ago, it used to be Cambodia, where then a gestational surrogate is waiting, the embryo would be imported into Cambodia, and the Cambodian clinic will insert that embryo into the womb of a waiting surrogate. So this is the global mapping I am following and, and I have researched for this book. And what I'm trying to demonstrate is how the desires of the various actors involved in the industry feeds into the design of this industry. And one of the desires that I talk about a lot, which hasn't come up too much in our conversation today, is the desire for whiteness, where a lot of people are looking for white egg providers for a variety of reasons. But let me stop there because I don't know whether we'll have time for this discussion, but maybe we will in the Q&A. Yes, I do have uh, some questions on that, but I also, my. Um... It's filling up with questions from from the chat as well. Um, I've gotten so, I've received some questions uh, via private message. Um, there was one for you, Amrita. Um, what happens with surrogate moms after they give birth? For example, healthcare and etc. Um, what what comes after giving birth for surrogate mothers? Yeah, so I'm sure Sarojini could also pitch in this uh, quite effectively. But what I have, as I said, that I have studied the same clinic and worked with the same surrogates for over 10 years. So I did have the privilege, I should not call it the privilege, but the opportunity to be with surrogates when they were pregnant. Uh, and they had quite a few of them had beautiful relationships with their intended parents while they were pregnant. Doesn't matter where the intended parents were, they would continue to call the surrogate as Sarojini had already pointed out in the movie. They would be having Skype conversations and whatever problems of communication might exist, the matron, hostel matron or the doctor would make sure that there was a lot of communication between the surrogate and the, especially the intended mother while she was still pregnant. But almost in all the cases, once the baby was born, and in almost all the cases, and we can have another discussion on reproductive justice issues here, or obstetric violence, if I can call it that, in almost all the cases, the surrogate mothers were forced into cesarean sections for a variety of reasons. One is so that the timing could be calculated in such a way that the intended parents could arrive in time to have the baby. But in almost all the cases, the baby was either taken away from them, even while she was just gaining consciousness from the C-section or she was recovering from C-section. If the intended parents felt that they wanted the surrogate to breastfeed the child, which was also very unusual, most intended parents and most clinics don't, don't encourage breastfeeding because they don't want any bond to develop between the surrogate mother and the baby. But in some cases, the intended parents wanted the surrogate to breastfeed because of the health of the infant. Um, then a little bit of more interaction post-birth, but otherwise the baby was taken away from the surrogate right after birth. And that's been shown in several documentaries. I talk a lot about that in the play that I do in various mm -hmm. forums, uh, uh, Made in India, Nose from a Baby Farm. We have a whole section where we talk about the pain of waking up and kind of gaining consciousness and realizing that the baby has been taken away. So that's one aspect, the pain of the severing of the contract. As soon as the product has been taken away from you, the relationship is severed. So that really pains the surrogate mother. But also the bigger question about what happens to their health care. Um, so the clinic and the hostel where, where I did my ethnographies, Everything was very informal. The surrogate was allowed allowed to recover for up to a week, 10 days, if she needed that. And uh, the matron and the doctors had this kind of a matriarchal role. So they did 
give some kind of informal help to the surrogate while she was recovering post birth but it's not mandated by the contract it was never something that was a right of the surrogate after giving birth it was the generosity of the clinic if she was allowed to recover in the clinic and the hostel there's this um, quite quite painful story of a surrogate in i think it was in bangalore where she um, had excessive bleeding after the cesarean section and she passed away after giving birth and her husband came to the clinic and said this was because of the c section and he was told but you can't prove it right she went back home so there 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 is no kind of law which says that the surrogate mother has to be taken care of post birth and it's not just the medical aspect the physical pain of it the emotional aspect of it um although there might be various guidelines for um adopting children as far as surrogacy goes there is no kind of conversation with the surrogate as to what do you want after giving away the child what happens if you're pining for the child can you pick up the phone and call the parents and say hey, i want to look at the child there are no arrangements like that because everything is so informal and nothing is laid out in contractually or legally so very often the surrogates would be uh, i would i would meet them after 5 years so a lot of them end up being egg donors or becoming workers in the clinic or they make their life around the surrogacy or egg donation business even if they can't become surrogates anymore because of their age or because they've had too many c sections already but they would say that i still think of the baby and it's been 8 years he would be 8 years old today um so that's a, a lot can be said about what happens to the surrogate or what does not happen to the surrogate after birth mm-hmm. thank you so much sarojini if you like to add or yeah oh you are on mute unfortunately I don't hear you I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yes. Oh. Just one more time. Click one more time. <laughs> yes. Okay now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. Um no, I agree with Amrita, uh, but a couple of points I would like to add here is uh it's very complex it's not that easy to articulate or narrate the experiences of the surrogate uh, uh, mothers uh, what we try to uh, argue with the policy makers you know that is something which you know, you know the entire process of relinquishment you know how uh, because it is still in the private sector you know i just wanted to reiterate that <clears throat> all the time in questioning the state's responsibility in providing access to healthcare you know it it is a maternal health issue also you know when we are talking about maternal health and then maternal mortality and then morbidities postpartum care and also the importance of breastfeeding in our own larger health policies why it is not applicable in the context of surrogacy you know i i think that is something as an advocate it is very important to pressurize it in the policy itself those reforms are very very important it is a paradox at one level we are talking about breastfeeding promotion at other level we are coming up with the logic of uh, breastfeeding uh, the surrogate mother breastfeeding will create some kind of bonding where she will not give up the child which is rubbish which i don't agree uh, you know it's not necessary only when you you know the breastfeed you will develop that bonding even in the context of the adoption not only in the biological even otherwise also the bonding exists so that is something which is uh, a very uh, uh, superficial kind of logic i feel uh, and many surrogates even they want to relinquish also you know that is what our experience and because they don't want to have any more links because it is very painful at the same time they want to move on with their lives you know enter into other surrogacy or maybe you know uh go back to their own families so we could see both pain and uh, at the same time wherever our child is there that's what in our film one of the mother says we pray for the other child also you know uh, that is what they believe in uh the second thing which i just wanted to maybe you know i missed that point the new legislation now you know which is very the recent legislation not new we try to argue about the you know uh 
the issue of uh, whether it is during the egg donation process or during the uh, commercial com surrogacy, whether it is altruistic or commercial, where is the compensation? You know? Though we could bring in insurance, but insurance will take care of the other, you know, uh, aspects. But for the death, there is nothing. And because our own, like, uh, like I am one of the petitioners where the egg donor died in, in our own, you know, one of the clinics here. And I went to the Delhi uh, Commission Medical Council to deal, make sure that the, you know, the family will get some kind of justice, not only monetary, you know, because it, there was a medical negligence that happened and then she died. And uh, because she, there was no facility in the clinic during the, you know, egg retrieval process and there was no backup. She has been shifted to three hospitals. By then she died. So that was something which, these are all our own experiences, you know, when we are talking about advocacy or pressurizing, this kind of uh, experiences do matter a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, that you're not talking, you know, in vacuum or you're biased or you're, you know, uh, these are the rights we are talking about. So mm -hmm. in this context, we wanted like, you know, uh, some kind of, uh, I don't want to use the word compensation, but some kind of justice, you know, what will happen to the family? What happened to the kid? This uh, lady had a three-year-old child, mm -hmm. uh, the egg donor. So what will happen? You know, it's also very important to talk about the state's responsibility or the clinic, it, since it is in the private and they cannot just get away with it. What Amrita said in Bangalore, if the woman died with some kind of uh, issue during the C-section, which is again a kind of why didn't they, if why why aren't they equipped enough? You know, to every maternal death is preventable, mm -hmm. so we cannot just leave it and then say, you know, oh, this is because of this. So this is something which we need to also look into. How do we bring in justice and the human rights issue, not only ethics. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jovan, um, you are mostly focused on, well, you're mostly focused on Western Balkans, and we talked a lot about India uh, in this panel, but I would love to also hear from, um, you know, your work in Montenegro and the Western Balkans. Could you tell us a little bit how are queer individuals um, discriminated against in the reproductive rights in, in Montenegro and in the wider region? Uh, well, first of all, there is no uh, unified regional recognition of uh, queer families. Uh, Montenegro, for example, uh, uh, recently in 2020, uh, got a law on same-sex partnership uh, and uh, it still cannot be implemented because there is no political will to adopt other laws required for this implementation. Uh, you are still required to get sterilization in practice in order to change your legal documents. That that was my case and many other cases. Um, regarding reproductive uh, reproductive uh, justice and reproductive technologies, um, in some countries uh, there is uh, available. Uh, uh, there is. Uh, how do you say that? Like availability for a single woman to access uh, reproductive technologies, uh, but it's very limited and uh, there is no open options for queer, uh, queer couples. Uh, so I would say that uh, Western Balkans is far from reproductive, uh, for, from reproductive justice, but at the same time, for example, and this is also a matter of class, in Serbia you have a prime minister who is a lesbian, and uh, with her partner she has a child, uh, and this is a country where there is no law on same-sex partnership, so by law, her family is not recognized, and uh, by law, her child is not her own. 
But in practice, she lives openly with her queer family because she's a prime minister. <laughs> and uh, these are all like paradoxes that we're living in. And uh, I think that the topic of reproductive justice at this moment is very far from Western Balkans because in Western Balkans, reproductive justice in general, uh, in regards to in regards to queer people is something uh, that can uh, face a very strong backlash. We have a rising anti-gender narrative in the region, uh, which is led by both religious and political officials and instrumentalized uh, for their uh, for their purposes. Uh, there are uh, the beginnings of discussion for abortion rights. So in this kind of uh, this kind of setting, I think it's very hard to even think about reproductive justice uh, for queer people in Western Balkans region. When I explain to people that I had to go through sterilization just to have a personal ID, uh, which is in uh, correspondence with my gender identity, Pe people are shocked. They say like, how come like sterilization, that's awful. But I say to them, yeah, the state requires for me to remove my reproductive organs uh, while also not having any access to reproductive uh, technologies in order to have my personal, uh, personal documents changed. But this is not communicated. Uh, this is not communicated with, with people. And also, this is the interpretation of institutions of our laws, uh, because our laws are very vague uh, in, in regards to this issue. And uh, this is the interpretation uh, which is based on the default assumption, of course, you're going to be sterilized. You cannot like have these genitals and be a man or these genitals and be, uh, and be uh, a woman. And the whole concept of mother and father is very, uh, is very strict. And I think that in regards to reproductive justice, this is, these concepts are also something that we need, uh, that we need to uh, uh, further discuss. What is family? What is a mother? What is a father? Uh, uh, how do we frame all of these concepts? What is justice in regards to the right to family and uh, right to your body autonomy and your right to equal uh, uh, access uh, to economic resources? And I just want for, for the end to state one thing. I don't think that the right to biological family is only about biological family. It's very much about legal family because your genetic material is something which is very connected to laws and your rights in regards to that uh, in regards to that family. So for example, a lot of queer people are doing insemination at home. If they do it at home, the state does not recognize them like parents. So by law, you are recognized by, as a parent uh, by your genetic material. So when we have restricted access to reproductive technologies, for example, for people who are able to do that, some of these people do the insemination with donors at home. Uh, how they get the material, there are different practices, like some people use friends, some people use uh, have arrangements with their, uh, their family, and this is also something that uh, requires a lot of discussion, uh, and some people uh, order uh, reproductive uh, material from abroad on the black market and etc uh, etc et but besides besides that when you go through all of this effort at the end uh, you do not have the legal right to your child uh, because this is not uh, regulated so I think that uh, the right to family and uh, having your own uh, family is very connected to uh, how the state uh, recognizes you as a family and uh, uh, as a parent. Thank you so much. Um, it's very very interesting overview. Amrita, um, 
On this panel, unfortunately, the anti-ableist perspective is not included, um, but people with disabilities um, have different views on, uh, on this because of selection, right? Because of the, um, because of how eugenic selection can happen. Um, so how, if we start, maybe we start asking, but how is the selection of embryos um, shaped by the socially normative concept of a healthy body, of a productive body? And how can we control this eugenic um, selection process um, with, uh, yeah, how can we control these processes and, and how, do, what, 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 how do we produce? That'd be basically the question that I'm asking, which bodies are we reproducing? Mm, that is that is a very pertinent question, Sham, and I'm I'm glad you asked it because very often we don't think about these issues when we are talking about uh, surrogacy in these plan panels. And one of the things that I wanted to start with is that often science is thought of as a very objective field that doesn't take into account social biases, that we assume that it's all free from pressures of society and politics. But when we look into selection of embryos or gene editing, so in my next book, I, I work a lot with uh, gene editing. So selection of embryos and gene editing falls into a trap where we don't recognize that these sciences have many social assumptions that are often not uh, being emphasized or we are not aware of them as the public, so-called public. And, um, and of course, as you can guess, what I'm going to say is that one of the social assumptions that we don't see is that very often these kind of gene editing sciences, selection of embryo sciences, privilege those who are already privileged and harms the least privileged. So what in the reproductive world, we talk a lot about new reprogenetic technology. So reproductive technologies and genetic technologies. And what does it allow us to do? So the macro picture is that it allows us to decide what is desirable for the future, what is the desirable future generation that we want, and what is undesirable. And so obviously the postscript then is that we can keep the desirable and eliminate the undesirable. So what it boils down to again is questions of justice. Who, which are the lives that we consider worth, are worth living? Which lives are worth keeping? Which lives are worth, worth bringing into the next generation? And by uh, implication, which are the lives which can be easily extinguished? So that becomes, so when we talk about reproductive technologies, we really need to engage with the disability justice movement because of these issues. So many of the things that we actually might assume are undesirable, who defines them as undesirable? Diseases are socially constructed. Diseases are constructed over time. Things that are undesirable have been also constructed over time. And I, I, I won't go into the science and the details of gene editing or, or, or embryo selection here, but the basic ethics of it, the sociology of it, the activist in you should be questioning is that what these advocates of gene editing or embryo selection are relying on is changing the biology of individuals or changing the biology, the makeup of our future generations, rather than changing the unjust structures of societies in which human beings live. So what embryo selection and gene editing focus on is individual enhancement. Let's make everything fitter, better, healthier, rather than social change. So what that is doing again, and again, things that uh, the fellow panelists have been pointing out too, is that what they're doing is that they're increasing our reliance on the market and reducing the need for state support for human well-being. So why are we saying that we don't want children with any kind of challenges because we want a world where we can choose the fittest the bestest and it's all about our individual choice but instead of that we need to change the focus and talk about the state and what role does the state play 
in ensuring that whatever be the challenges of the individual, they have the full capacity to live a life. Um, so, okay, so let me stop at that, but I, I can talk way more if there's any question about reprogenetic technologies in the chat. Thank you so much, Amrita. There is a question actually exactly on that, one small question. Um, it's, would it be different if the state would be paying for surrogacy instead of couples? Would there be less misuse? So you mean, I, I'm assuming that I can take the first yes. stab at that answer and then the fellow panelists can jump in. Um, you mean if it's public funded, if the state funds mm -hmm. surrogacy, mm -hmm. um, will it be less misused? Well, they, I don't know about that because we need to now unpack the, the word misuse. I think it will lead to more equity. So more people would be able to get access to reproductive technologies. Um, so, and it, it does happen for technologies in many parts of the world, some parts of the world where there is uh, medical care and state funded medical care, where at least the first few rounds of IVF are paid for by the state. Um, does it lead to less misuse? The assumption there seems to be that intended parents are misusing the technology or they are going in for it even if there is no need because I, I, I don't think there'll be less misuse. I think it will increase equity to a certain extent. It'll still be the bodies of women which are put online, whether that be for egg provision or, or surrogacy. It, there will still be the stigma of infertility that will be driving people to do things to their own bodies and the bodies of other people. But yes, if the state was paying for various kinds of infertility treatment, more and more people from across the economic borders to say could get access to these technologies. Thank you. I have. I also had another comment. Um, but it's, it's more of a. I think it's a question comment. I'm not sure, but uh, it's uh, they they write. I don't know who it is. Um, in some countries, IVF, for example, is paid by the state for the women who cannot conceive. Um, what is the difference if the state would pay for queer people to have surrogates? Um, somehow queer. Um, gay and trans people mostly are always seen, they're always looked at as selfish when they want surrogacy. Um, so, Jovan, perhaps you can try to speak to that if you want to, but um, yeah, I, I, I agree with that statement. I think, well, I mean, the stage is yours if you would like to add. Well, I know that queer people are usually uh, looked at selfish when uh, we ask for reproductive justice, but I think that that's not the case only for reproductive justice. I think that this is the case generally when marginalized people are asking for more resources which are available to the ones who are more privileged. Uh, so in regards to that, I think that my, my question would be, uh, uh, my, my answer would be very uh, short and it correlates uh, to what Amrita and Sarojini were saying when we speak about equity. This is a long discussion, this is a very deep discussion and we need to speak about the inclusion of diff different people with different characteristics because access to reproductive justice, this is not only a debate of straight people and queer people, like women who are born without uterus, uh, women who uh, had a cancer, women who have like cardiovascular uh, issues and cannot uh, get into pregnancy. I'm just like uh, stating some of people who are in need for reproductive uh, justice whether people see me or anyone else as selfish for wanting to have equal access to resources like everyone else from my personal standpoint i do not care uh, <laughs> but i think that uh, we should care as activists uh, on how we speak uh, about these issues. I, for example, I have received many comments when I was speaking about, not about surrogacy, but other reproductive, uh, uh, reproductive uh, technologies. Many people told me, but why would you do that? Why just don't adopt? Because like that's 
the connection that people are making. Like uh, some people, they have the right to choose whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And some people should settle uh, for this. And I think that uh, whether I would adopt or access any uh, reproductive technology, like that should be my access to the available resources and not uh, 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 because any, and I really like what Amrita said about science, that science is not objective and that it had like science, uh, people make science and we all as people, we have our a uh, set of values, a uh, set of principles. Therefore, we also have our set of prejudice and stereotypes and stuff like that. There is a very strong track record of science being very patriarchal uh, that, that can be seen in uh, many research regarding, for example, differences between men and women. Uh, and uh, I think this is very, this is very uh, indicative because when we speak, about who is able to access to what resource or who should access to what resource, we speak about who deserves to access uh, to uh, some specific uh, resource. So maybe that at the end was not a very short answer. But, uh, <laughs> you, you get my point, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, There's so many uh, questions coming in just four minutes before the ending. Um, I had, um, I mean, it, this, we, this is one of the questions that I wanted to ask from the very beginning. Um, and I wanted, perhaps it's a good add to what you said, Jovan. Um, but, uh, so is there an individual right to have your own child? And what about reproductive justice for all the involved actors? Um, who wants to jump in first? Perhaps um, Sarojni. Uh, it, it's very difficult to, you know, uh, answer to that. But what I strongly believe in is that, like, even in our own constitution, you know, which we believe in is the right to life. Uh, that includes the right to reproductive autonomy. Uh, and that includes to right to parenthood and right to procreation. So uh, that is where we are. And they also include right to privacy, dignity, and integrity of the body. So uh, that is exactly, you know, one we are also trying to bring in, you know, uh, because uh, as I said in the beginning itself, the legislations both, whether it is assisted reproductive technology regulation bill, or whether it is surrogacy regulation bill, so they must take into account the right to parenthood of the everyone. It's not just, you know, uh, only the heterosexual couples, uh, whether, you know, the living couples or LGBT community. And uh, that then we are, you know, in a way we have ratified many international conventions, you know, and that's where I think it is very important to talk about it. But again, at the same time, you know, it's a very complex situation. Though we are, uh, there is a, a very, uh, we had this uh, section 377, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, uh, where, uh, uh, you know, that has been, it has built, you know, the homosexuals uh, or criminalized it. You no, know, it has been decriminalized a few years ago, section 377, but the stigma, uh, uh, it's still there, you know, mm -hmm. decriminalization of section 377, it, you know, it didn't end there, you know, it, it appears even in the legislation. So you are making it very clear that, you know, marriage is very important to become a parent, okay, mm -hmm. in the legislation, even in other legislations too, not only in the ART and surrogacy bill, but even in all the other family laws. So there is no convergence among the legislations. So you are making marriages compulsory at the same time, you only decriminalized homosexuality, but marriage is not allowed. Mm. So it's, it's very, very, you know, that is where, you know, our, uh, when we talk about reproductive justice, uh, which is very important to talk about uh, these layers, you know, even if we make sure, okay, there were, you know, a couple of uh, uh, court cases challenging that 
marriage should be allowed for homosexual couples so that they can access other but it wasn't in the sense like it may or may not because there is a bias which is there in the law which is there in the society uh, which is there where you know to some extent in the science side i don't want to say every science is bad but you know the biases are still there so that is where something we need to and i'm very glad that you picked up the issue of uh, uh, persons with disability and their right for parenthood uh, it's very very important point and that's where we are engaging in india too with the disability rights movement and queer rights movement so that is very very important to achieve anything you need to go along with different movements so that you will know the nuances from their own lived experiences yeah, so that is where we believe in yeah thank you thank you so much um yes jovan you raise your hand yeah i just want to to uh, address uh, one question that rola yasmin uh, posted to chat it's uh, regarding israel and palestine and i think that this is a very important question i'm uh, i'm not familiar with this practice but i'm very familiar with pink washing of israel uh, and i think that uh, before you move on could i mm -hmm. read it out loud because of yes, the recording <laughs> um rola yasmin who's who's going to be on the next uh, panel discussion uh, she wrote reproductive technologies are high in use in Israel and specifically directed at queer and trans couples um, with um, to create an image of gay rights in middle in the Middle East but this pink washing is also done to procreate a population to further expansion um, of the to further expand no, to, to the further expansion of the occupation of Palestine there's no reproductive technology and definitely no reproductive justice to Palestinians under occupation in fact maternal mortality and morbidities are high and very directly connected to occupation is this use of reproductive tech and pink washing something you have seen in other eugenics and ethnic cleansing state projects perhaps you Jovan and then Amrita could speak to that very, very good yeah, question. yeah. I don't want to answer to this question. I leave this to Amrita uh, or Sarajini. Uh, I uh, only wanted to have a short comment on this, especially because you mentioned individual rights, and I think that there are no individual rights if we do not access social and structural structural issues. So the whole point of individual rights is not that I do what I want to do without uh, any uh, responsibility in this world, but the point of uh, discussing uh, the, the right to uh, reproductive autonomy, and I really love uh, this, uh, uh, this concept, is that uh, we speak about equity and access to resources uh, in regards to reproductive technology. And I'm very glad that this was raised uh and because especially because i think that uh, any advancement of human rights can be abused by political structures and we see that across the world for example my own country is pink washing all the time stating that they are the leader in the region uh, while not working on structural uh, structural issues and uh, not only not working on structural issues but at the same time uh, uh, reproducing oppression that queer people are, are uh, having. Of course, this is not the same uh, case as the case of Palestine, but I think that these issues should be raised, should be addressed, and should be pointed out whenever we speak uh, about uh, uh, about these topics, because it's not only about how we advance human rights, but also how human rights Actually, the concept of human rights is abused by different political structures in their own political uh, agendas. Thank you so much. Amrita, we, we talked about eugenics. What about, um, what about ethnic cleansing state projects? Yes, that's a really hard question and a fantastic point that Rola Yasmin has raised. Uh, we cannot do justice to it in 30 seconds for sure, but it's important that this was raised. The kind of eugenics, ethnic cleansing and systematic genocide by the Israelis against the Palestinians, of course, you cannot see that being imitated in, thankfully, you cannot see that imitated in many parts of the world. 
But these sciences, reproductive sciences, reproductive technology do have eugenic tendencies. And that is why we need to move the discussion away from the discussion of choice. Uh, to the, it, we cannot think of these technologies as individual parents making a choice about the future offspring. And this is something that I am trying to unpack systematically in the next book. The kind of eugenic strains that we are seeing are far more dangerous in some sense because they are far less observable and they are far less blatant than a state-based genocide. Um, uh, not to say at all that I am trying to downplay what's happening in Palestine. That is a story that needs to be asked and told over and over again. But bringing back our discussion to what we've been talking about in this panel, the, the science of reproductive technology can be liberating. Of course it can be. It can be used for radical change. But the point of activists and critical scholars and people who are listening to this panel, for instance, would be to question whether the science and the technology is being used in equitable and just ways. The, what we've seen till now with reproductive technology is that it's fundamentally gendered, it's based and it makes claims and it holds responsible mostly women. It is, it has, um, impacts which are based on equity, inequities based on race and class and sexuality. We all know that. So the idea that reproductive technologies will just, can be just linearly celebrated and will bring about how radical change is being naive. We need to be able to cast a critical glance at each and every technology and make sure that it is working with justice at the forefront and not just access by the privileged. Thank you so much. That's a very beautiful ending. And also a good, um, a good, uh, well, a good, a good keyword for me to play with because next time is our last time we come together for this discussion series and we will be talking only about reproductive justice. Um, we will be um, the the topic of next of the next uh, online discussion series is framing reproductive justice, and um, the, we will be honored with uh, Loretta Ross, um, professor and activist, and also the co-founder of the concept of reproductive justice herself, um, as well as Kalpana Wilson uh, from the University of London, and Rola Yasmin, who's just raised this very important point. Um, thank you. So, uh, thank you again, Rola. Um, uh, I hope you can join us for this panel. I am so sorry to the three questions that I did not ask, but perhaps um, the panelists are so kind to accept your answers, um, uh, to accept your questions in their inboxes. And if they have the time, they uh, I see I see a nod in your van's face. Um, it would be great uh, if you could just ask them via mail. I'm so sorry that we didn't have the time uh, to to raise them. Um, but I see I can see clearly that this the the topic of reproductive technologies is a is one that I I think just in the last half an hour, I think we got to the points where you would like to raise. And I think there's so much more to this topic um, that uh, that we haven't discussed even, that we've only just um, brushed the surface of. But I think you've done an amazing job, all three of you, just to open up the topic for a lot of people. And I hope um, whoever is watching this picks up the book, picks up your work, picks um, up where you left off and, uh, and contributes to this very important um, topic. Um, thanks again, um, and thanks, uh, a, well, very warm thanks to the panelists, and I hope you all have a great day or evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.